Great, welcome everyone. And those of you who are still joining, we welcome you. My name is Lydia Dugdale. I'm the director of the Center for Clinical Medical Ethics at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons in New York City. And we're delighted that you all can join us for tonight's talk. Uh, I just wanna make an announcement that we are recording this event and it will be posted to our YouTube channel. I'd also like to ask that as questions come to mind, you add those to the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And then at the end of the talk, we'll take uh, 25 minutes or so for Q&A. And I will moderate that with uh, tonight's speaker. Um, so before I hand it over, I just want to give a tiny bit of background on the impetus for tonight's talk. Uh, uh, several months ago, a group of medical students at Columbia approached me uh, to explore further the ethics related to questions of intersex persons. And uh, this is a topic for those of you acquainted with it that can be very emotionally charged. And um, it's a topic which I would ask that we all handle with the utmost uh, sensitivity and care as we discuss it. Uh, so and when I met with the students, um, they, they, I, think, I think, Diana, you had just been studying about it in, in class, and uh, there was a lot of interest in, in exploring further uh, issues that, that persons living with uh, intersex have had to face and had to deal with over the years, and how uh, there have been shifts in the thinking on how to medicalize it or not. And so we uh, are delighted to be able to explore this further tonight. Uh, without any further ado, I'd like to hand it over to one of our medical students, Diana Perez, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, so as Dr. Dugdale mentioned, I'm part of a group of fellow medical students who have been working on organizing for intersex justice and promoting standards of care that center the lives of intersex folks both here at Columbia and beyond. And I'll also just like to mention that I'll be dropping a link in the chat for people to fill out if they're interested in receiving more information from our group. Uh, so now it's my privilege to have the opportunity to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Katrina Carcasis. Dr. Carcasis is a cultural anthropologist and bioethicist who examines medical scientific beliefs about gender, sexuality, and the body. Her first book, Finding Sex, Intersex, Medical Authority, and Lived Experience, explored controversies over medical interventions for people with intersex traits. This was followed by research and advocacy on sex testing of uh, elite women athletes. Her latest co-authored book, Testosterone, an unauthorized biography, was published by Harvard University Press. A Guggenheim Fellow and member of the Institute for Advanced Study, her work has been supported by the National Science Foundation, the Social Science Research Council, and the American Council of Learned Societies, and has been published in Science, BMJ, and the American Journal of Bioethics, among others. She was an expert witness in Duty Shan's successful appeal of testosterone regulations at the Court of Arbitration for Sport, CAS, and consulted with Castor Semenyo's team prior to her hearing at CAS. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, Wired, and the New York Review of Books, among other outlets. So I'm very excited to now turn it over to Dr. Garcases. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. As I was, I'm in San Francisco right now. And so actually, first of all, let me say that it is really important. I want to thank Dr. Dugdale, Diana, as well as all the other students who I hope are here somewhere, um, as well as Charlene for bringing me here and making it possible. It has special resonance. I went to Columbia I did my MPH on 168th. I learned about intersex there. I started my dissertation there. Um, I interviewed physicians there. So there's that resonance, but I'm also currently in San Francisco. And San Francisco is where I first met uh, Beau Laurent, who at that time was using the name Cheryl Chase, who's one of the founders of the contemporary US intersex movement and got her well wishes to start on my research project that became the book that you mentioned. So a lot of lovely synergy and I'm excited that you're um, talking more about this. It's just thrilling. So I'm gonna talk for a little bit, then we'll have the q and I did have some slides. So let me start by sharing that. Um, and then we will go forward. Okay, so, um, here we go. Let me start with a short video. Raise your hands if you have testes. 
I'm Pigeon. I'm Alice. I'm Emily. I'm Cypher. And we are Intersexy. Intersex describes a person who doesn't fit the typical definition of male or female. I have XY chromosomes, but typical female genitalia. I'm a girl who has testes and XY chromosomes. I identify as a queer, gender non-conforming intersex person. I identify as a black intersex man. Intersex is not new. It's been around since the beginning of human existence. I mean, there's probably even intersex dinosaurs, if you think about it. Transgender has to deal with your gender identity, whereas intersex has to deal with your biological characteristics. Often, intersex people get surgeries that they don't want, and transgender people have to fight for surgeries that they do want. They gave my mom the excuse that the internal testes were cancerous, that I would develop cancer. They didn't even come up with an excuse, basically, in terms of a health-related reason. They instead just said it was about the appearance. A lot of doctors are very uncomfortable with the idea that I have testes, and they're still trying to get them removed. But I'm perfectly healthy, and there's nothing wrong with them. They did a surgery to remove my testes and told my parents to take me home and just raise me as a girl. And I didn't find out about it myself until I was 12. There aren't a lot of options, or medical providers don't explore other options. My mom would put me in dresses, and she would be like, oh, aren't you so cute and you're so pretty? And I would be like, no, nah, this is horrible. <laughs> I was um, put on hormonal treatment, which consisted of estrogen and progesterone. I just wanted to belong. I wanted to fit in. I didn't want to be different. So even though I knew something felt amiss, I conformed. He was very condescending. He was like, you intersex activists don't know what you're talking about. It's difficult for intersex people to find each other because from an early age, we're told not to talk about our bodies. I did feel like I was the only one. My doctors always told me there was nobody else like me. And so it just perpetuates a vicious cycle of shame and stigma that we can't break out of. I would tell another intersex person that you are worthy. You are lovable. Your body is beautiful. You're beautiful. Intersex people don't need to be fixed. There's nothing wrong with them. I know you feel like you might not be able to get through this. I know you might have really dark thoughts, but I want you to know that meeting other intersex people and finding a community or a support group can be one of the most important aspects in your healing process. And we're out there. We're out here. We're here. And I just hope you can find us. Okay, I wanted to start with that in part because I'm going to close in a way with the work of some of the individuals in that video, but also to foreground the fact that it is commonplace around intersex to talk about cases and diagnoses and that I always want to remember that we're here because we're centering humans and humans that in many ways feel that they've been harmed um, by clinical practices. So one of the things I just quickly want to say is sometimes we want to know um, how it is that someone claims to know what they know. And so this book is an empirical project that I did. Um, I did a lot of the interviews actually in 1999, 2000, 2001, a little bit later. And I interviewed intersex adults themselves, parents of children and adults, and also, um, a series of medical professionals who work with intersex individuals. So some of what I'm going to tell you is expounded on much more in this book, um, but and a couple of the quotes. But in any event, that is the crux of that empirical work. And then I've continued to work in these areas since then. So for me, it's important to bring in the long history. And so when we talk about the changes, what I want to do is situate them in a much longer period so that we understand how it is that we've gotten to the place that we have and perhaps why it is that change has been slow to come. 
And so prior to the 1950s, it wasn't the case that early intervention was routinized. In fact, you had different kinds of clinicians who um, saw patients with intersex variations. And in some cases, there were interventions that could be offered, and in some cases, there weren't that very often this happened at patient request and that it was more ad hoc. And by ad hoc, what I mean is that it wasn't systematized at that point. There wasn't a treatment protocol per se. It was addressed at patient complaints and concerns. And then a series of developments happened in the early 1900s that allowed for certain kinds of technological interventions, hormonal interventions, testing for chromosomes, um, scanning for internal reproductive organs, uh, development of new surgical techniques. And that is in part what this did was proliferate the number and kind of sex characteristics that one might track in the body and also the interventions that might be possible. And accompanying these, this kind of proliferation, if you will, of sex markers were competing ideas about what one's true sex was, which would become important as we hit 1950. And in 1950, John Money, who was an, um, a large, field, a large uh, figure in the field of sexology and also psychology, came up with a paradigm that he began to think about at Harvard, but really developed in concert with other professionals at Johns Hopkins. And he was trying to address some of those earlier ad hoc approaches, right, where maybe some physicians would understand gonads to be indicative of one's so-called true sex or chromosomal status or hormones or external genitalia. And what he started to do in his work was develop a multi-stage model of sex and gender development. And so he specified roughly six to nine uh, ways where we might look at sex in the body that extended all the way to gender identity development. And that importantly, none of this was determined per se by biology. So that biology was important, but that it wasn't determinative. Um, and he came up with what has been called the optimal gender hypothesis or the gender hy uh, socialization hypothesis. And basically what he posited is that there was a small window of gender flexibility that happened within the first 18 months of life. And that individuals, irrespective of biology, could be assigned male or female. And if you followed a series of interventions, those individuals would grow up to identify with the gender they were assigned at birth. And that one aspect of this was a, um, a need, if you will, a recommendation that children have genitalia that conform with the gender assigned at birth. This wasn't actually necessarily because um, they felt, he felt along with the colleagues that they needed that to understand themselves as, as men or women, although that was important. The primary importance was actually for the parents. And so it was important in the parents raising their children that he argued that they should see genitalia that conformed, that would help them to understand their child as a boy or a girl, and then be able to raise them according to that gender, whatever the norms were at that time. So because this provided, if you will, a theoretical rationale and a paradigm that was based on some clinical work and um, historical records, it was quickly and widely adopted in the global north, not simply in the US. It was disseminated very quickly in um, uh, clinical books. And it made intervention imperative and routinized so that prior to this period, there were individuals who would not have undergone so-called normalizing interventions, but it was increasingly difficult, especially after the late 1950s, to find people who had not been intervened upon as children. More importantly though, it really codified gender and sexual norms and the proper re relationships between genitals, gender and sexuality. And I'll talk a little bit more about what this means. Where does that come from? Like how, how did sexuality become important, if you will, in the intersex treatment paradigm? Well, in part, it came from Money's novel um, idea of what gender role is. Whoops, sorry about that. And he described gender role as all those things that a person says or does to disclose himself or herself as having the status of a, a boy or man, girl or woman. 
It includes, and this is my emphasis, but is not restricted to sexuality in the sense of eroticism. So this became very important because it really imbricated sexuality and gender together so that a male gender role assumes or even requires desire for females and vice versa, that males and females um, thus require each other and their respective parts, meaning um, the vagina requires the penis, the penis requires the vagina. And so an infantly properly assigned, an infant properly assigned and treated will be heterosexual in desire and express this desire via penile vaginal intercourse. Um, the phallic size and the surgical techniques have largely driven gender assignment. So in other words, as this is disseminated among various different clinicians and hospitals and clinics around the US, this was thought to be a limiting factor. And so I'm not speaking about contemporary, I'm sort of speaking about the traditional treatment paradigm, but as I think we'll, we'll get to, there are no, there's no question that some of these thoughts um, absolutely continue into the present day. And so for children, generally speaking with a 46XX karyotype, the idea was to assign female or girl at birth with feminizing genitoplasty. And conversely, for those with 46XY gender assignment as male, depending upon the size of the phallus. The Intersex Society of North America, which really started to come into being in the early 1990s, tried to characterize this. This was actually a refrigerator, mag uh, refrigerator magnet, but also a business card that they used where they started to really highlight the normalizing aspects of this and the way that it created, if you will, a no man's land for children's genitalia. So in other words, for a female assignment, um, it's this area on the left where there was a certain specification for clitoral size and anyone above that clitoral size who would be assigned female would have to undergo clitoral reduction surgery and possibly vaginoplasty. This middle area that's purple is where um, bodies were not allowed to stay. And then you had to have a phallus of a certain size in order to be assigned male. And that was typically one inch. So when I did my interviews, um, actually some of which were done in the New York City area, just to characterize this thinking, this is a surgeon that I spoke to and he said, if you took the case of a girl with a small degree of virilization who has a relatively normal vagina, so it's big enough for intercourse, then all they need is something to be done to the clitoris so it looks less like a penis. And yet another comment from another surgeon, again, around the same time that I was doing my interviews, which by the way, was a very, very heightened moment of debate. He said to me, have you seen a baby with CAH? It's grotesque. You're the mother of a newborn with clitoromegaly and fused labia. Are you going to change the diaper every time? Are you going to hire somebody? Who's going to be the caretaker? Are you going to let any neighbor change that child? Absolutely, positively not. You are tied to that child every minute of every day of every week of every month. You're not going to go on vacation. So I don't want to suggest that this was the view of every surgeon that I interviewed or every surgeon of the time, but you'd be surprised to know how prevalent these kinds of views were. And so in practice, what this meant is that um, there was quick decision making. There was an idea that the surgery needed to be done before that 18 month window that persists until today for a series of uh, sort of techno scientific rationales, that there was a withholding of vital health and treatment information. One interesting thing is that even though money was actually an advocate of informing parents and children at, um, with age appropriate information, this didn't end up happening in practice. And there was more of a secrecy model so that both parents were not fully informed and children often were not given complete information, both about their own bodies, but about the interventions that had been performed on them. It was also the case, and I think it still remains a significant issue that there wasn't psych psychosocial counseling either for parents or for the children themselves as they got older. 
And the focus on erasing atypicality, hence the title of my book, Fixing Sex and Conformity to Gender Ideals, right? So no understanding that people might enjoy and derive pleasure from other forms of sexual um, interaction with others or on their own, um, that they might not be heterosexually coupled, that they might be asexual, et cetera. So the assumptions then behind this paradigm, again, that continued out, atypical genitals equal ambiguous gender. And therefore that you wouldn't be assigning gender if you didn't perform genital surgery. And I had plenty of surgeons tell me this, well, what gender will they be if we don't do the surgery as though um, one couldn't exist without the other. The presumption that genital surgery is generally successful, which there's a whole chapter on this in my book. Plenty of people have talked about this and challenged this, most especially intersex adults themselves. And that fixing sex is necessary and sufficient for good quality of life. So in other words, if you had correct gender assignment and surgery, the child would have a good quality of life. And indicative of this is that up until, I would say fairly recently, over 90% of all studies that had been done on children with intersex variations and to a lesser degree adults only looked at gender assignment and surgery rather than broader questions of quality of life. So the way I would characterize this is a belief that there was healing um, versus curing. And so Curing here is the idea that you will just fix someone, right? Focus on fixing intersexuality. And that, that leads to a loss of focus on healing and human flourishing. The consequences of the focus on gender is, as I already told you, the outcome studies focused almost exclusively on gender change, surgical outcomes, sexual orientation, neglect of quality of life, but what adults and even adolescents have told us is that gender change and sexual orientation are not their primary issues, that the primary is issues that have been raised for them have been sequelae of their interactions with the medical community, even well-meaning medical community over their lifetimes, to the point where some had even stopped seeking medical care for fear of further stigmatization and inappropriate purient interest in their bodies when they went to seek care for things that had nothing to do with intersex. So the paradigm for quite some time went unchallenged, right? From the 1950s, really, I would argue up until the early 1990s. Part of this is what um, Mary Jo Good has called the biotechnical embrace, which is this idea that uh, a biotechnical approach to intersex um, would, would provide the kind of interventions that people needed to be okay in the world. I believe, and I heard from physicians that they wanted them to be well, and that created a bias, including thinking that they, the people that they had worked with were doing well, or alternatively, that the few patients that they heard from who were doing well were indicative of the larger population that they had seen across their lifetimes. But in many cases, because this was primarily pediatric surgeons, pediatric urologists, pediatric endocrinologists, they actually didn't see children through adulthood, um, in part because of the age differences, but also in part, some people stopped going and people moved. And so they didn't have continuous contact throughout their lifetimes. The care also made sense, if you will. And by that, it's the kind of um, sort of normative assumptions about bodies, gender, um, sexual orientation, sexual behavior that seemed like they were providing the best possible care. And because of some biases that I won't go into a lot, the studies reported good outcomes. One major reason for that is that quite often surgeons themselves were evaluating their own work on still very young individuals who hadn't reached adulthood. The US advocacy movement started um, in the 1990s. This was actually a very early protest from 1996, I believe it was 96 or 97, outside of the American Academy of Pediatrics. 
a meeting, I believe in Boston, and it was done primarily because the individuals weren't allowed entry into the meeting. And so around this time, you get an explosion of interest in this topic. The advocacy movement was incredible at garnering media attention. So it was all over television when we still had television, um, all over television and in print uh, media uh, around the US and very significant outlets. And some of the criticism, they were, they were very, they changed a bit over time, but some of the general criticisms was that intersex was a problem of trauma, trauma consequent to medical interventions and not a problem of gender. And that treatment itself had exacerbated this and that there was a way in which natural human difference and diversity and a variety had been pathologized by this paradigm and how it had been carried out in medical practice. And that surgery, while in many cases promoted as a kind of panacea or a way of assuaging parents' anxieties and concerns actually very often didn't address that distress. And that's certainly borne out in the interviews that I did. Um, and that honest, complete disclosure is essential. And that was a criticism because of course it had not been given to the individuals who were starting to agitate. The initial, this actually says initial US medical response, but one of them is a UK physician. So advocates as zealots and green wellied loonies, that's obviously the UK physician and support groups as being not represented. So in other words, this was the vocal minority. This is an argument. It's probably still echoed today. It was echoed for decades as a way of dismissing criticisms um, and arguing that it was a minority response. So I would argue that the ongoing challenges, there are many, but the over-focus on normative gender sexuality um, and you know, sort of relationships around that or um, normative gender presentation and sexual orientation and thus non-consensual genital and gonadal surgery. So I was talking to Al Idelson of Interact Advocates, which is the long-standing legal advocacy group um, in the US, powered by many youth, by the way, um, who actually said that there are data from California that show that the vast majority of surgeries, at least in California, occur before age six. So still very much early genital surgery happening at that time. Now, each of these areas that I'm going to talk about, ethical concerns, legal and human rights, each in and of themselves could be a detailed talk. You're going to see a lot of a lot of language on the slides. I don't expect you to read it all, but what I really want to do is leave you with an impression of what's happened since that um, early criticism. And you know, when I started to do this work, I would go around. Um, I think some people are on this call, but I would go around with uh, Beau Laurent, with Arlene Barretts. Um, who's an extraordinary physician and advocate, um, mom of children with intersex variations with Anne Tamar Mattis, who founded um, Interact, among others, giving ground rounds. And we had this idea that we would sort of have a road show where we would go to speak to individual um, clinics or physicians around the country uh, and also at medical conferences. This is a very slow, laborious process. Educating people, changing minds is not easy and one interaction is not going to do that. And the reason I tell you this right now is that we certainly weren't the only ones doing this. Advocates around the country were giving talks. Um, people were expressing their views on television. People were protesting through direct action. Advocates, um, both outside the medical community, but also sympathetic clinicians were writing articles. And a lot of it still faced an enormous amount of resistance. And in the face of that, many other kinds of arguments and avenues for change, where change essentially meant at its most urgent, um, slowing down or ideally stopping the early genital and gonadal surgeries, um, was just not happening at a pace uh, that felt um, that it was adequate enough um, in terms of harm. So the key ethical concerns are the non-consensual surgeries. And so we know through ideas about autonomy, 
and respect for individual autonomy that patients have a right to decide for themselves whether they want to have healthy sexual and reproductive tissue removed. So what we're not talking about here is a blocked urinary opening where the child cannot void. Those are not the kinds of interventions that we're talking about. Um, and that because the surgeries had been performed at such a young age, that individuals themselves were not able to consent to these irreversible surgeries. And so it's important, I think, right now to talk for a second about informed consent and how this works with children. So informed consent is actually a concept, an ethical concept that is really only for adults. In youth, it's called a informed assent. You can't actually consent as a, a younger person, depends, but under 21 or under 18, generally speaking. And so the law generally presumes that parents have the authority to make decisions about children's bodies. For example, vaccina uh, vaccination, that's one prime example when it's not against the child's best interest. But one key issue in terms of this is what is in the child's best interest. And there were competing notions about what that might be, um, where some surgeons and others were arguing that so-called normalization was in the child's best interest. And you had another group of individuals arguing that no, that was not in the child's best interest. In the best interest was being able to make a decision about one's own body and not suffer the short-term and long-term consequences of genital surgery and gonadal surgery. So in terms of informed consent in children, the American Academy of Pediatrics basically says that only patients who have appropriate decisional capacity and legal empowerment can give their informed consent to medical care. In all other situations, which is what this is at this point, parents or other surrogates provide informed permission for diagnosis and treatment of children with the assent of the child wherever appropriate. And there's ethical debate about at what point and to what degree children can participate in decision-making. But in general, that ability to begin to participate starts at roughly seven uh, based on the child's capacity, increasing as the child gets older um, so that some have full decisional capacity well before becoming an adult. Um, the AAP statement on informed consent also says pediatric health providers have legal and ethical duties to their child patients to render competent medical care based on what the patient needs, not what someone else expresses. Um, and that these exist, these duties exist independent of parental desires or proxy consent. So we have a basis already for pausing in order to allow children to be able to consent um, or assent in a context that, that existed um, before actually thinking about intersex, right? So this predates intersex. Um, some of the problems with trying to implement this though is um, notions that parents who were completely distraught may not be able to give meaningful informed consent. And this is a legal as well as an ethical um, issue. I have a paper with Arlene Barrett's that, um, uh, and I think Antomar Modis, I'm trying to remember, it was a while ago, that talks a little bit more, um, a couple of papers actually around decision-making around genital surgery that I think is still very salient. But there was also ex excessive provider optimism and misleading language. And so to give you one example, the notion that, um, that a surgeon might say they will fix the child could lead parents to think that there would be um, no possible residual sign of atypical genitalia or surgical intervention. And if you talk to adults, that's absolutely not the case. A failure to tell parents about the medical controversies and to explore all options, including non-surgical interventions. And this comes up in multiple places, but uh, in my thinking around this, but I'll mention it now. And Tamar Modis gave a really wonderful framing at one point where she said, um, if you present or frame the problem as atypical genitalia, then surgery starts to look like the only solution. But if you frame the problem as concerns about how other care providers will respond, how children in the school's class might respond, then a wealth of other options open up that are not irreversible surgical options, like educating those around, providing ways 
uh, to educate caregivers and others. But very often that isn't what happened. And so there was a rush to fix. And then a conflation of what is necessary for physical health and what's being recommended for other reasons, like the idea that the child might be able to pee standing up, like the idea um, that the child would develop the gender identity associated with their assignment or be able to have um, uh, heterosexual uh, penile vaginal intercourse. Okay. Other problems were dis discomfort discussing sexual function, sexuality, and gender. So in my work, for example, I had quite a few surgeons tell me that they never discussed this with, the, with their patients, uh, parents prior to doing surgery, underestimating the children's capacity and need for input into decisions about their bodies, some cultural differences between for providers and parents um, and not understanding parents' assumptions or real concerns, right? So maybe the idea that um, the performing of genital surgery would have a significant impact on the child's sexual orientation, which is not the case. Okay, so some legal issues um, primarily have to do, I would argue, with gonadectomy and sterilization. And once again, wrote an early fantastic piece because this hadn't been addressed yet. Um, that you can access where she talks about this more, which is how early gonadectomy can um, actually sterilize minors, even minors with uh, intersex variations where there might be an assumption without actually knowing that the children have no reproductive capacity. But of course that changes their ability to biologically reproduce or contribute biological material um, is changing, obviously, with new reproductive technologies and assisted reproductive technologies, which, of course, will change as the child grows from one year old to, say, 25, 30, and 40. So in terms of sterilization in the law, it's important that we understand what sterilization is, remove, removal of viable testes or other gonads, hysterectomy or removal of the ovaries, and any procedure that reduces the patient's ability to participate in reproduction. In terms of the law, often there's no statute or case law that actually addresses sterilization of children with intersex variations or really of any other kind of minor. There's a great deal of work about children with um, developmental delay or other kinds of disabilities, but there isn't anything specific, and there wasn't at the time, for example, that some of this work was really getting challenged. And so there is a fundamental right to reproductive freedom, and this is based in a lot of state and federal constitutions. So parents generally have constitutional rights to make medical decisions for their children, but um, especially those that are medically necessary, but this is absolutely not an unlimited right. So I already talked about vaccination, but um, courts have actually limited parents' rights to make these kinds of decisions when it comes concerns reproductive rights, reproductive justice, and reproductive capacity. And so the law understands sterilization differently from other medical procedures because it affects reproduction, and parental authority does not include the ability to authorize elective sterilization. Part of what Anne was doing when we were going around was informing um, the legal departments at various hospitals that they should be seeking court approval in order to perform sterilization on youth with intersex variations. And very often the hospitals were unaware of the risk and they didn't even think that they were performing sterilization because so many of these interventions were looked at in the context of a kind of normalization and that in their mind exempted it from these kinds of considerations. But eventually I think quite a few have come around to understand that this does fall under laws about sterilization. So what if there is a medical justification? As with so many things with intersex, there is very often um, where people create a kind of a gray area or where the devil is in the details, right? So what is medically necessary? What is considered cosmetic? What is considered reversible or irreversible? And is avoiding masculinization a medical justification? What about risk of cancer? How much risk? What if the patient isn't fertile? And how do you think about that when they're still deriving benefit from their own natural hormones, although they are not actually 
um, at least in that moment in time, not understood to be fertile. And these are all important considerations, but they're also important um, scapegoat arguments, if you will, to continue early gonadectomy. And so in terms of cancer risk, uh, that's an area as well where increasing work showed that actually in many cases where physicians thought that there was early risk of germ cell tumor, it turned out not to be the case for quite a few diagnoses where early gonadectomy had been performed. So one of the most important areas of development has actually been in terms of human rights. Um, if I think about the last 20 odd years that I've been involved as an ally to um, people in the intersex community and working on these issues, it's been a series of, at times, what's felt like throwing spaghetti at the wall to try to figure out how to move the medical community to think in more complex ways than what I've previously described and to honor some of these ethical and human rights considerations. And so, like I said earlier, I think there was an, uh, an assumption that speaking about one's individual experience um, would sway, but in the end that was viewed very often as anecdata or isolated cases. Then there were attempts at court cases. Many of those were not public. The resolutions were not made public. There weren't that many and physicians were really reluctant to testify against other physicians in the community. There were statues of limitations, right? So that was another mechanism that people have tried. Some cases have definitely been successful, but it's never quite been enough to see the kind of broad shifts that advocates have been seeking over the last 25 or so years. And so another avenue or route to change was human rights arguments. There has been so much that's happened in this area, I can't possibly outline it all, and I'm coming closer towards the end of my time. So I'm going to go more quickly through this, but I can point you to where greater detail is on some of the human rights violations. One of the most important things I want you to know is that there have been now perhaps 50, if not more, proclamations around um, medical interventions on people with intersex variations as being human rights violations. So medically unnecessary surgery on intersex children has been condemned by, you can see World Health Organization, American Medical Association Board of Trustees, three former US Surgeons General, um, Physicians for Human Rights, the AISDSD Support Group, Amnesty International, UN experts on children's disabilities, women's and health rights, Lambda Legal, the ACLU LGBT Rights Project, Human Rights Watch, and intersex-led organizations around the world. So we are talking, what's left out of this actually, there are yet more um, from uh, professional physician organizations that I haven't included here. So the international human rights laws, um, some of them, uh, first that were first called in to sort of bear on this particular issue was the World Health Organization, which in 2013 talked about eliminating forced, coercive, and otherwise involuntary sterilization, which I've talked about. In 2014, seven UN agencies, including WHO, released a joint statement condemning unnecessary, unnecessary surgery and treatment on intersex children without their consent. Again, what I really quickly want to point out is the way in which ideas about what constitutes unnecessary surgery has become this mushy middle that has, um, because of various interpretations and framing around this, um, has been a way to try to minimize or argue that certain surgeries that are still being performed don't fit this definition. Malta was one of the first countries in the world to legally ban these surgeries. The Committee Against Torture, which is charged with looking at cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment, um, has uh, the UN Special Rapporteur has talked about the way in which these surgeries fit their understanding of torture. And below, you can see what year and which countries have been called to task for continuing to perform these surgeries because they are understood to be uh, 
to be torture. And again, we're talking about minors who are not able to consent. Everyone understands that adults should be able to make their own autonomous decisions. Council of Europe weighed in on 2017 with the Committee on Bioethics, once again, condemning the surgeries. In 2017, Human Rights Watch, um, in collaboration with Suji Tamar Mattis um, and Interact, performed uh, an empirical study about practices in the US arguing um, uh, 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 providing evidence of all of the continuing human rights violations that happened with contemporary um, medical practice in the US. In terms of children's rights, there's convention, the Convention on the Rights of the Child that can be seen to apply to these surgeries. Um, again, won't go into detail there. Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women that can also be seen to apply to these surgeries in which there have been um, relevant statements made. The right to bodily autonomy, which exists under the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, um, more right to bodily autonomy in various countries that, um, that have been uh, taken to task or alternatively um, been criticized uh, because of violations of right to bodily autonomy, rights to health, which came out from the UN Special Rapporteur on the right to health, um, arguing for postponement of surgery until the child can consent, and the Yogyakarta principles, which um, was a way finally to include intersex specifically in um, thinking about human rights. It was a really important development. Um, uh, Kimberly Zeisselman, who's currently the executive director of Interact, and also Morgan Carpenter, among other advocates, participated in putting these principles together. And part of what came out of this was the right to legal recognition um, uh, uh, without reference to sex, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, sex characteristics. Um, and also right to bodily and mental integrity and right to truth. So where I wanna end now, which I hope will foster some discussion is what have been some of the latest developments? That is a long um, history truncated, truncated to a very short amount of time. Um, this is, you will perhaps recognize Saifa and Pigeon from the very first video. They are founders of the Intersex Justice Project, um, in particular, trying to change practices at uh, Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago, including a lot of direct action. Uh, Pigeon was actually um, a patient at that particular hospital. Saifa is actually now in the UK pursuing a PhD um, related to an intersex initiative um, there. So that's really wonderful. Um, and so what are some of the changes? These are really recent developments. I'm talking within the last year. Um, Lurie was the first hospital in the US to apologize for intersex surgeries. There had long been efforts to get hospitals and particular physicians to apologize and that had been incredibly difficult. And have, uh, Lurie has committed um, to a series of reforms after a year long activist campaign, especially by the Intersex uh, Justice Project, but also by very sympathetic and important allies from within Lurie. And so it's really the combination of direct uh, action and also clinicians agitating from the inside um, to try to sway the views of their uh, fellow physicians and other medical care providers in the community. So this was also a years long effort to make this happen. Most recently as well, Boston Children's Hospital, um, fairly soon uh, on the heels of Lurie's, has said it will not perform clitoroplasty or vaginoplasty in patients who are too young to participate in a meaningful discussion of the implications of these surgeries unless anatomical differences threaten the physical health of the child. And the decision here came from the hospital's behavioral health, endocrinology, and urology program. And this is also a direct effort um, from, again, um, colleagues influencing other colleagues and trying to to bring to bear other evidence and other ways of thinking to kind of affect this particular change. It's been a long time coming and I think it's a tremendous step forward. Um, 
Lori uh, more recently is having a national symposium on CAH surgery this spring. And meanwhile, quote, these surgeries will not be performed on CAH patients until we have evaluated the best practices and ethics and have released a white paper or report on the topic. Um, Lizzie Reese is a bioethicist and um, historian who's written a book. Uh, recently, she added a, an additional chapter. It's coming out in a second edition. And I asked if there was anything I could link to, but she said, not yet. It's just in the book. But one of Lizzie's arguments is that there's been a longstanding debate about whether or not CAH, which stands for congenital adrenal hyperplasia, that is the most prominent uh, intersex variation. It affects 46XX girls, at least insofar as interventions are concerned, um, whether or not this counts as an intersex variation. And Lizzie's uh, point is that this isn't simply a debate about semantics or nosology and how to think about it, but that it has direct ethical implications because by exempting CAH from the understanding of a difference of development, difference of sex development or intersex, what it does is bracket it off from all of the kinds of conversations that I've just spent all of this time talking to you about. And so it circumvents the informed consent process because it makes it seem as though um, those kinds of concerns don't apply in this case. So CAH is an area of ongoing debate, incredible debate about um, not only whether or not it counts as a difference of sex development, but um, ongoing debate about the appropriateness or not of early medical interventions. And so perhaps we'll talk more about that. And it remains to be seen, I think, what Lurie is going to do about this and whether they'll hold fast with what they've said or not. Um, this is a picture of Interact advocates uh, outside the US, uh, US not US uh, capital, the uh, California capital. So another really important development also being spearheaded by Interact, but in collaboration with other um, LGBT organizations has been uh, a just uh, proposed a piece of legislation by Scott Weiner where California would require parents and doctors to postpone elective surgery on intersex children into the, until they are six years of age and can take part in making such a medical decision. Um, one of the things I wondered if we might not wanna talk about is how we think about that six year demarcation. From an ethical standpoint, it's not meaningful because children still cannot really consent or assent, if you will, at the age of six. On the other hand, there is the argument that if the vast majority of surgeries are performed that age, that might this not be a model of harm reduction. Um, I think you can also make the argument, um, and I've certainly had to deal with this a lot in my work on sex testing, where in sex testing, people often want to carve out in sport so that essentially human rights violations should be allowed in that area uh, for various reasons, because sport is somehow different from other domains of civic life. And so we might wanna say, is this something like that, where this is a carve out um, that creates problems because it suggests that human rights are not always already um, important in all, in all areas of civic life at all ages, or is this a method to try to um, try to delay um, or at least stop the vast majority of early surgeries? And how do we understand this particular shift? Um, if we would want an older age, what might that be um, in that way? Finally, there's the Pediatric Endocrine, Endocrine Society. So I'm probably gonna finish right on time about, I think this is my last slide. Um, which has come out with its uh, own statement. Er really early on, there is someone that I encountered a lot in my work who was a um, clinician who worked with intersex children and uh, families of intersex children, who I called Mr. On the one hand, Mr. On the other hand, and this person shall go unnamed. But essentially, every couple of years, he would rewrite the exact same paper with updated citations, where on the one hand, 
Um, there are intersex advocates and others arguing that these create harm and all kinds of arguments that I've just mentioned. On the other hand, we don't have enough evidence that not doing surgery is beneficent or doesn't create harm, right? So that's sort of an odd construction, but that's what people have said, you know, not doing surgery um, does harm. And therefore, uh, we need to collect more evidence. Now, you will see threads of this thinking over and over. I have heard this argument now for 25 years, 25 years of hearing, we need more evidence, we need more evidence. We either then are incapable of collecting adequate evidence or will we are incapable of um, taking a strong stance in the face of the evidence that is there. And so I want to acknowledge that I think physicians are in a difficult position, that it is not always the case that physicians pressure um, uh, families to do surgery. In some cases, families very much want the surgery. Um, so it works in both directions. Uh, and I do acknowledge that sometimes physicians have felt pressure. Um, so the Pediatric Endocrine Society, to me in reading this, I interpret as a, on the one hand, on the other hand. It's a frustrating document in my view, but it says it advocates for a process that includes providing patients and families with full evidence-based information. However, there's already a problem here because um, we have plenty of people arguing there's not adequate uh, evidence on, on all sides. Um, and then at the same time in the same document, the available data are too limited to allow for a fully evidence-based balancing of the above risks and benefits. So on the one hand, we need evidence-based. On the other hand, we don't have the evidence. In the meantime, we've had 25 years of children being operated on while this debate about what constitutes appropriate evidence continues on. And I think it's delayed justice in the intersex movement and that we wanna be um, really careful about um, how we assess these kinds of statements, understanding them in the long history of activism. And finally, this last statement, furthermore, there is no robust outcome data that individuals with DSD, so that's differences of sex development, who have undergone surgical revision of their genitalia are any more or less psychologically healthy than those who have not. So that is an important statement. I'm fairly certain that is my last, um, oh, no, sorry. Here's one more of what I, what I would characterize as a weasel statement. The PES opposes government bans, so i.e. what's happening in California, for example, on genital surgery for DSD because legislation cannot integrate the myriad of factors that determine the choices for any specific individual. I, in saying this, do not want to deny the complexity. However, it is critical that we acknowledge that these kinds of statements have been precisely the kind of windows through which normalizing procedures have been rationalized as normalizing procedures, right? Where particular kinds of techno, um, techno scientific arguments, for example, about better tissue healing on younger patients, lack of memory about surgical intervention on younger patients and as a reason to do early surgery, right? All of these in my mind are these kind of weasel statements that perpetuate the status quo. And I think we need to be clear. I understand why physicians want to do this, but I think it allows too large of a window in some cases um, for the kinds of long-standing rationalizations, um, not among all, absolutely not among all, because there's a high degree of uh, difference in opinion among the various specialties and uh, caregivers that are out there. But um, too often this has been operationalized as a way to continue for the status quo. And then I think that is it. So I will stop screen sharing. Um, and, oops, how can I, oh. Did it stop on its own? You stopped it. It's I did. I guess you. when you hit the last slide. Fantastic. That's what it does. Okay, perfect. So thank and, you for that. Yeah. Katrina. It was wonderful. And I just want to ask everyone to please put questions if you can in the Q and A, although some of you put them in the chat. So I'll try to get both. And I'm aware now that we have many uh, activists on this call and leaders in the field. Um, for intersex justice. And so just again, Elizabeth Reese has her, her second edition of her book title in the chat. And Sean Seifawal, who you said is in the UK, I believe, must be the middle of the night there, Sean. We're honored <laughs> that you joined us. Um, intersexjusticeproject.org.
Uh, Kimberly Zeisselman, I hope I have your name correct, uh, has a uh, link for interactadvocates.org. And then of course, our own Diana Perez uh, with uh, information for the Columbia Students for Intersex Justice. So for those interested in getting involved with advocacy work and learning more or supporting the intersex community, uh, you have many uh, links here now. Uh, I'm just going to, Katrina, if I may, start with the questions in the chat and then we'll move to the Q&A. Um, I'm thankful also to Dr. Arlene Barretts for helping uh, to with, give us some more information there. Uh, but there's a question about uh, how parents can be fully informed prior to delivery since the majority of these intersex conditions are not diagnosed until birth or shortly after. She says it's also very challenging for a parent entrusted to make choices for their child until such time they can choose for themselves to get the guidance they need. How can we inform expectant parents to be prepared for this? So um, one quick comment, there is so much expertise on this call, but I think the way it's set up as a presentation, we can't actually have people chime in on video. So I would also encourage all of these amazing people who are here to provide their own answers and comments and resources as they've already done, because these are the people I look to, to inform my own thinking. And so I would really like um, for that to happen. Um, so one of the, if I'm understanding it, um, the idea is that perhaps uh, there might be someone who's pregnant where there's an understanding that there's already an intersex variation and how to prepare them. I think the most important thing there is actually to connect them to peer support. When I have talked to people over the years, the most important thing in this movement has been to connect with others. That youth connect with youth, adults with youth as mentoring, advocates with advocates, and parents with parents. Because parents who have already navigated some of the things that concern um, soon to be parents or parents of infants have a tremendous amount of resources um, about, for example, how to think and weigh surgical options, how to think about risks, how to think about raising a child who may not have typical genitalia, how to think about long-term consequences. Um, and so the AIS DSD support group, which I hope that someone has, I know someone will put it in there, um, is a tremendous resource. They have a meeting where parents can come. At times they've even uh, had a travel fund to help parents who are lower resource. Um, I imagine, I don't know for certain, but I imagine perhaps in Zoom times, maybe there are other ways that people are connecting. I think it's the most important thing. And it's one of the things that we had tried to institutionalize earlier on. Um, I, I'm going to say something that's probably going to be controversial, but my talk. Um, not all support groups are the same. Okay, and so some support groups are going to be um, more unquestioning about surgery and um, uh, more pro-surgery, if you will. And so I would want people, that's fine to seek that out. And, uh, but I recommend the AIS DSD support group for a rounded view all the way around, including concerns about uh, surgery. So I hope that helps. Um, the other thing that I've heard from so many parents is just complete normalization of that birth um, process so that it doesn't mean to say nothing and obfuscate, but it absolutely means to say um, there are some tests that we'll want to run. We have plenty of resources and we're here for you and we're so excited for you and your child's going to have a great life. And um, unfortunately, our parents I spoke to where clinicians said really harmful things that have stuck with parents for a very long time. And so that early moment and tone is just so, so important around and framing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And maybe just a follow up that is partly related is the question of uh, corticosteroids in the prenatal period to prevent leaving. Yes. Yes. So I have not written a lot on that. People who have written on that um, are uh, Ellen Feeder and Alice Drager. And I think Antomar Modis has written on that as well. 
absolutely the arguments they're making and what I would think when you look at the argumentation for dexamethasone, which is really something that was, um, I would say, uh, largely pioneered and utilized by a pediatric endocrinologist um, named Maria New, is that one of the key issues um, wasn't simply to avoid atypical genitalia, but ideas about producing a heteronormative baby, right? And so a girl who would um, not be lesbian, who would identify as a girl who would be gender conforming. So um, because I haven't written a lot on that and I haven't looked at the latest things, I don't think I want to um, weigh in too heavily other than to say it raises grave concerns ethical concerns, and that there have been quite a few um, ethicists who have argued against that, and I would refer you to their work. So let me just put some names in here um, to find their publications. And then, of course, if anyone else from Interact or elsewhere wants to weigh in, please, by all means, um, put something in there. But uh, okay, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm just... Um... Looks like uh, your colleagues have been doing a great I job. I love it. Hey. I love it. It's like we're a multi, multi-headed body over here. This is, uh, what more could I ask for? It's beautiful. That's great. Uh, there's a question about what data is available on the mental and social impact of children who have not undergone sex assignment surgery. And I guess, um, I know you said, I mean, we kind of concluded with there aren't a lot of data. Um, I. I, I guess I asking to um, personally how how you how you counsel parents. Uh, the peer support is good, but I I have friends who uh, were very surprised to learn that they had an intersex child and felt completely um, ill prepared and um, not even ill prepared, but felt like they didn't receive good counseling and they weren't in a resource poor setting. So it seems that even in you know in elite academic centers, we still kind of waffle in our ability to address these things well. So I don't know if you want to comment on um, on the data we have or don't have for surgery or no surgery, uh, or how to counsel parents who just received this news that their child is intersex and are just kind of didn't even know intersex was a thing, right? Which mm -hmm. is why advocacy is so important. Um, you know, it's interesting, 10 years ago, I would have answered this very differently. But as you were speaking, my mind was was going. And so I'm going to answer this in perhaps an unexpected way, uh, but a way that feels meaningful to me. Um, uh, I know some individuals who have not had surgery and are incredibly grateful for not having had that and have come to you know, not simply accept their own genitalia, but love it. But the, the um, I guess I pause a little bit at that question because it's hard work to do. If we understand that from roughly the late 1950s on, the vast majority of children have had surgery and it's only, I, I would say, in maybe the less, last 10, 10 to 15 years that there have been more and more people um, who have been raised without surgery, then we're still just getting the beginning of that group who hasn't had surgery. There's a, large, a larger representation of that group in the AIS DSD support group. And insofar as I know, they are incredibly happy and thrilled to not have been intervened upon and to have that be their own autonomous choice. The part that is the unorthodox way that I want to answer this is since doing the sex testing work that I've been doing, it has put me into contact with people in other countries on other continents where this kind of routinized information, uh, sorry, routinized infor intervention is not practiced and where essentially sports authorities in many ways are trying to mandate this kind of intervention for participation in sport. And all of the women that I have met through that work have never had any issue with their bodies as they are. It never occurred to them there was a, so they have intersex variations, never occurred to them there was a problem, never been bothered by an atypical genitalia, in some cases haven't been seen by, by 
by physicians. And so it hasn't been medicalized in the same way among a lot of that group of women. And so obviously it's different circumstances, but in a way it's really interesting to see in countries where this hasn't happened, there's no concern that it happened, right? That there are plenty of ways that families and they themselves um, don't understand that difference as being a meaningful kind of difference that, that necessarily is even difference rather than just how someone is. You know? Yeah, so it's sort of the conundrum in the US maybe is partly related to how we medicalize and make everything, have a therapeutic response to everything that doesn't fit. Yeah. Yeah, up. and I don't want to say the latest studies because I don't know. I, I imagine there are other people, perhaps Arlene in there, who might um, who might want to weigh in on some of that. But I worry at times about that because the the notion that um, there's not evidence that people without surgery have have done well seems to be an argument, a concomitant argument to do surgery. And so that, that sort of conflation of the two separate issues at times raises concerns for me. I'm not at all suggesting the person who asked that was, was uh, coming from that particular framework, but that is a kind of argument that's been used um, in that way. So I've only given some anecdotal information, but perhaps others can, can share um, systematic studies, that, the latest systematic studies that have come out. I want to also ask a question that maybe dovetails on the, the cultural piece, which is uh, capitalism. And this is from one of our own medical students here at Columbia. How do you think capitalism has informed or continues to inform current institutional practices and decision making shaping intersex healthcare? Okay, that's a great question. Um, one of the things that I talk a bit about in the in the book um, is how expensive uh, some of these interventions are. And I want um, I don't want to suggest that they're being done because they're expensive. But in some cases, when there has been discussion about not performing medically unnecessary surgery, one of the sur surgeries that gets talked about a lot and debated about is one that I have not mentioned, which is hypospadias surgery. So this is when the urinary opening is not at the tip of the phallus, right? It might be sort of, um, there's, there's different grades of it, but it might be slightly off center or it might actually be um, on the underside of the phallus, sometimes where the phallus is not uh, fully fused. And so this is a surgery that provides the bulk of the practice for pediatric urologists. And so I have heard from urologists and others that if those surgeries were not to be done, that would provide a really large financial hit, right, to clinics for pediatric urology and perhaps others, uh, pediatric surgeons who do that work. So there is a way in which now there are gender clinics that are not just um, always for intersex, sometimes they're with transgender, you know, for trans youth. Um, and those clinics require a patient base and they require money to have a clinic. And having a clinic is actually an expense. And so you need to bring in particular patients in order to justify to the hospital that particular clinic. And so in a sense, that kind of collection of people is incredibly important because it brings the expertise together and stops some of this ad hoc ping ponging that had been happening among families um, before these uh, centers of excellence develop. But I don't think we want to not think about the way in which um, specialties are, um, specialties are continuing or, or have the bulk of their practice be some of these surgeries. And the way that that is going to shape those specialties advocacy, for example, in California, about whether or not there should be a ban. And to me, that should not ride on the back of people's bodies, right? That that is something that, um, uh, that there are other routes to figuring out um, how to support pediatric urology and the important work they do without it having being a, uh, a body, you know, a, a body of work on uh, people with hypospadias. No, and it highlights the sort of bigger problem of, of how money factors into healthcare more broadly. Um, 
question we don't have time to answer right now. There are so many more questions and I'm sorry we can't get to all of them. I do appreciate the efforts of everyone on this call in answering questions, the resources that have been posted. I invite you to explore those. And Katrina, I just thank you so much for sharing thank with you, us, for enlightening us, um, for engaging with our students here. And we wish you all the best with your important work. Oh, thank you so much. All right, take care, everybody. It was lovely being with you. Good night.